Hi everyone and welcome to The Crow's Show brought to you by Chemist Warehouse. I'm Mark Pickley. And I'm Alana Smith and we're counting down to the clash with the Bombers later this afternoon at Adelaide Oval. Shortly, Cop Chairman Rob Chapman identifies the biggest challenge facing the AFL. And later, we'll revisit the day the Crows gave Essendon a finals lesson. The midfield was certainly on top and actually I remember, I think Ivan Maric had an absolute field day in the rut. This week's historic signing of the club's first female footballers is another major step in the formation of the Crows' second national team. West Australian pair Kelly Gibson and Chelsea Randall are the Crows' nominated marquee players, with other squad members to be drafted in October. Let's learn a little more about them as they embark on their exciting journey. It's incredible just to think that I'll be pretty much one of the first or the second person to sign for um, the Adelaide Crows women's team. Um, I never thought it would ever happen. I think to be honest I, I was all I was still pinching myself and, and it was only until last night when uh, Tex Walker, the Adelaide captain, obviously gave us a, a call, myself and uh, Kelly Gibson, and um, it started to sink in where, you know, this is actually happening. You know, when I was 11 years old, and to think that, you know, you weren't able to play football, we weren't allowed to. So to be, um, you know, given an opportunity to be playing football at the most elite level in AFL and to be wearing the yellow, blue and red colours for Adelaide Crows is just an amazing opportunity. Into the path here of Gibson, look out. Here she goes, closing on goal and makes no mistake. Uh, my interest started when I was probably about 13 years old back in um, WA. I was 11 years old when I first started playing football and I uh, moved into the women's uh, pathways when I was about 14. So I uh, started playing state when I was 15 years old. Um, from there on it's just, yeah been given lots of opportunities. So I was lucky enough to get picked up when I was about 17 for the for the Bulldogs uh, when it first started out in 2013 so it was a great opportunity playing on the MCG. It wasn't until 2013 that they got the, um, the Bulldogs and the D's up and running um, that I could actually have a chance of playing AFL as a semi-professional or professional sport. The Melbourne defence. Oh. It's a fantastic mark by Randall. Incredible mark, Chelsea Randall. Amazing feeling and I feel so honoured and privileged to be a part of Adelaide Football Club. Um, you know, they, they first started in 1991 and that's when I was born so it's, I'd like to say, a bit of a bit corny there but, you know, it's, it's a pathway and maybe something destined to happen. As marquee players, Kelly and Chelsea will each receive $25,000 for the two-month season beginning in February. While Crows players and coaches represent the very public face of the Adelaide Football Club, behind the scenes there's another team of officials and support staff who are equally important in achieving success. Leading the way is the board, responsible for senior appointments, governance and financial performance. Chairman Rob Chapman says the board must always have one eye on the future. You wouldn't associate the board with on-field success, but I suppose it does oversee all of the strategy that provides the money to do all of the things that the coach deems necessary to make sure that you've got success on-field, like providing all of the resource, the facilities, and making sure we've got the right people in right jobs. We do exist to win premiership, win games of finals football. But it is broader than that these days, and it needs to be, because you need to be looking at the ongoing, sustainable financial success of the club. That then dictates the resource that you have available to uh, invest in your football operations. We have had some significant uh, challenges to deal with. Uh, I'm very proud of our board. I'm very proud of the whole football club in, in how we've dealt with those challenges. I suppose the board and, and the directors sort of are the first port of call in, in, in leading, uh, you know, how you go about dealing with those challenges. And, and collectively, you know, they stood up and uh, assisted with the leadership on how we dealt with, you know, certainly Phil's passing last year and, and other challenges that we've had to deal with over, over time. The biggest challenge for the AFL industry is going to be uh, the outcome of the Enterprise Bargaining Agreement. I don't think there needs to be winners or losers, there shouldn't be. I trust the AFL to negotiate our way forward, but you must ensure that clubs are financial, that clubs are profitable, that 
those people that are paying and attending, the families, the mums and dads, the kids, the sponsors can get to an affordable game of football and enjoy the experience. And thirdly, the players themselves must be fairly looked after. Jenkins, he might be this one go. back. He has, I think. Josh Jenkins has kicked three goals. This is a football club. We never refer, refer to it as a business or an organisation. It's a footy club. And I want to make sure that we remain a football club, a successful football club, both on field and off field. And look, I think we're in as good a shape today as we've been in the 10 years that I've been there. Rob has been chairman since 2008. He and other board members volunteer much of their time. Coming up after the break, players learn some life-saving lessons. And Andy Elton gives us the good oil in the Crow's kitchen. Welcome back. We all love our football, but good health and personal safety will always be far more important. This week, players have been reminded of how lives can be torn apart in an instant. They heard a special presentation from Kim Inglis, who lost his wife and both daughters in a car accident six years ago. He's now using his family tragedy to deliver a powerful road safety message to young people. He was joined by the club's Motor Accident Commission Ambassador, Sam Jacobs. I still find it really hard today to um, explain to people sort of what goes through your mind when you've just been told by total strangers that your whole family's um, died in a car crash. I think it, it really delivers a powerful message when someone who's personally been through something like this uh, can stand up in front of a group of people and, and share their story and, and just try and instill on them the impact that it's, that it's had on, on our lives as well. We are sick and tired of cutting young people out of car crashes. You guys are role models. <coughs> If you pull up at the lights and you go to check your Facebook out and you got someone next door looking at you doing that, they think it's okay to do. Young people represent around 12% of the South Australian population but are well overrepresented when we look at road crash statistics and young men in particular because of the risk taking behaviour, the nature of uh, peer pressure, we see that uh, they are overrepresented. If it's an awareness we can take in as a group um, and then we can spread the message to not only our friends and family but also our fans um, as we're ro role models in society, um, you know, I, th I think it's a great thing. And we see Sam has a connection to road safety but we're able to actually use his profile and use his status in the community to help us to deliver those important messages to the community. Um, being from the country, obviously road traumas, um, you know, a big thing back there. So one's obviously too many and um, you know, if we could play a little part in trying to improve it, then it's, it's something worthwhile. Well, as Crows fans eye the finals in a few weeks, let's wind back the clock to 2009 when the club scored an outstanding 96-point win over Essendon in the first elimination final. Jason Portpleasia was on the receiving end of some great delivery and finished with five goals. Tipper did well, laid it down to space, but Atkinson on to it. Tries to break the tackle, can't. Vince getting a lot of it early, holds up in the tackle, gets a left foot away. Is it I think we had over 50,000 there that night and I guess just the, the atmosphere was electric. And another forward getting a touch and Henschel going two full forward to Taldo, but Papusha, right man, right spot. From memory Essendon sort of just scraped into the finals and I think we finished fifth so um, we were unlucky I think to miss out on top four so you know we had that disappointment but I guess you know finishing fifth we got the home final. I remember the first quarter was tight, but by sort of halfway through the second quarter, we'd sort of worked things out, and um, from then on, it became a pretty enjoyable game to be a part of. We sort of built up a fair lead by half time, and once we sort of snuffed out any realistic chance of a comeback in the first five minutes of the third quarter, then um, we knew the game was sort of going to be played on our terms, and the last quarter and a half was um, some really enjoyable football, probably one of the most enjoyable games I've played in. So for Pleasure, at his third, steers a three. Looking at 100 points here. 
The midfield was certainly on top and actually I remember, I think Ivan Maric had an absolute field day in the ruck because the Bombers came over with no real sort of um, legitimate ruckman and um, Ivan just cleaned up and was putting it down Bernie Vince's throat and we had uh, Andy McLeod running off half back so when you've got uh, McLeod and Vince lacing you out it makes it a pretty easy job as a forward. 26 goals for the night, um, a pretty big score and uh, I guess when you kick 26 goals there's plenty who get on the scoreboard so um, yeah I was lucky I got a couple of junk time ones there late and uh, that was pretty nice but um, yeah I think Brett Burton kicked a couple uh, Richie Douglas kicked a couple, uh, Kurt Tippett ended up with a few and um, I think at that time we had a fairly potent forward line, Trent Henschel was running around as well so um, there were always guys who could bob up and do some damage, Chris Knights was another one, I think he kicked a couple as well so um, yeah we sort of shared the load a fair bit that night and uh, everyone got amongst it. So Adelaide win by a record margin and inflict a record defeat on the Bombers in the first of the final. Unfortunately, that's as far as the Crows went that year, going down to Collingwood in the semi-final by just five points. Now, Andy Otten fancies himself as a dab hand in the kitchen, sharing the cooking at home with his fiancée. So, thanks to Thomas Farms, we gave him the opportunity to pass on some of his culinary advice. All right, guys, so today um, I'm going to be cooking the super speedy salmon and our snow pea fettuccine. First, pretty easily, we just want to get the pasta on nice and early, so add some salt in the water, and then we get the fettuccine out and uh, chuck it in, so that'll take the longest to cook, so we get that on first. So now, once this heats up, we can add in the salmon, and then add in the red onion as well, so that'll soften up. So what's great about the Thomas Farms kitchen is it just says step by step what to do, so it's very easy to follow um, and makes it very easy uh, for people like me to, to cook a really nice meal. I moved out of home when I was 18 years old um, and mum often sends me uh, some recipes via text message and uh, a lot of her old favourites are I love cooking. So I reckon the pasta's ready, I'm just going to put it straight into the, uh, to the salmon and the veggies, give it all a nice twirl, join it all in. Alright, time to plate up now. This is where I probably lack a bit with my finesse, but we'll give it a go. And lastly, a little bit of parmesan on top of the dish. And there we go, there's my super speedy salmon and snow pea fettuccine. Looks like necessity helps to make a good cook. Stay with us, still to come on The Crow Show, we'll find out what goes on in those quarter and three quarter time huddles. And Kirtley Hampton might be fit again and happy to face the opposition, but is he ready to come up against Brody Smith? Kirtley Hampton has made an impressive start to his Crows career in the Sandville after overcoming early season injuries. But how do the hard yards of recovery compare with a grilling from Brodie Smith? With the help of Aussie Ripper Roasts, let's find out. All right, Curly Hampton, welcome to the Ripper Roast. Right, thanks for having me, mate. Um, you've come over from G GWS, obviously, spent um, your first few years there. How have you found the transition to Adelaide? Yeah, no, it's been good. I uh, spent yeah, five years there at the Giants, um, four years in the AFL and then a year there um, at the development stage. Um, and yeah, moving back to Adelaide, went to school here, uh, year 11 and 12 at Emmanuel. It's been really good um, for my partner as well, she's from here, uh, Port Augusta, so it helps her out a, a, a fair bit and I've got, got some family and I've got my younger brother at Emmanuel College as well, so, and it's also closer to where I'm from, Alice Springs, so my, my parents and that come come up probably every four weeks, so no, nah, it's been good. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your injury, obviously you've had a couple of games back now, um, just talk us through um, I guess the process you went through and um, how you're going now playing for you again. Yeah, it was, it was pretty frustrating, um, wanted to get to the club and just you know, try to establish myself in the preseason with, with hard work and um, try to get that uh, relationship with all the with all the new boys or new teammates, I should say. Um, and yeah, so 
couldn't couldn't get through the injury um, and ended up having to get surgery. Uh, it was the longest time I've been out um, since I've been in the AFL, so it was pretty tough. Um, I got got through, and yeah, it's good to be back playing now. But it's pretty good to have you know in reserve side um, that plays in the sample. You know, play play against good players every week. So no, nah, it's been it's been good. And off the field, uh, you obviously got a tight relationship with a lot of the boys here. Um, any nicknames floating around we should know about? Oh, I used to get I used to get drizzy a lot at, at the Giants because um, they all think I look like look like Drake. So <laughs> I got that a lot, and a few boys have started calling me that here. Um, uh, and just just Kurt, it's a bit of a hard. Like Kurt is a bit of a different name. Not 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 too many people have that name. So yeah, just Kurt. All my family call me Kurt. No one really calls me Kurtly. So yeah, probably just Drizzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Curly Hampton. Oh, thanks for joining us. No worries, brother. Cheers. Players and coaches spend hours each week practicing skills and planning strategies for the next match. Yet on game day, they have precious few minutes to correct mistakes and adjust tactics. And that all happens in the breaks between quarters when players are trying to recover. In this segment, Under the Coach's Roof, brought to you by Revolution Roofing, Scott Camparelli helps us understand how coaches use the time. As always, quarter time at the Adelaide Oval. Well, normally we have a bit of a chat before we go down, just so to make sure that we're all on the same page. It's a six minute break, so normally the players will give the first couple of minutes to themselves just to get a drink and just sort of chill out for a bit. Uh, and then the, normally the line coaches have a couple of minutes with, with their group. Uh, we keep it really short, really succinct, make sure that um, you know, we cover off one or two areas, uh, don't confuse them too much. And then the last two minutes is always with the senior coach, so Pikey will do a general overview of what needs to be done. It's a half time. Half time you generally get a little bit more uh, time, I guess, because um, you do get a longer break. Um, normally they, you know, we have laptops, we have TVs, you know, we have iPads, so we can generally do a little bit more visual stuff uh, if we need to. Generally the players are, uh, are pretty self-aware of what's going on and it might be just one thing that we need to touch off on. Obviously a lot more detail and a lot more information that comes down now, so we've got to be wary of that as coaches. You know, sometimes we want to give them everything, but you know, it just needs to be one or two things. A lot of information in a very short space of time. After the break, Alana searches for our face in the crowd. And when the season's over, it's time for a holiday. Come away with Jared Lyons. players have a few minutes to spare, I'm sure their thoughts turn to where they might go to get away after the last game. Thanks to our friends at Flight Centre, let's find out from Jared Lyons where he's likely to relax at the end of his fifth season with the Crows. My favourite holiday destination would be Koh Samui um, in Thailand. Uh, just because it's, it's relaxing, it's quiet, the beaches are unreal. Um, there's always something to do there. And yeah, I've been there once before and, and loved it. Probably not the hustle and bustle of uh, mainland Thailand that you'd get. Um, people are amazing, the ho hotels are unreal. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed my time there. I think next for my holiday destination would be probably the Maldives. Um, kind of similar in terms of uh, relaxed, the, the beaches are unreal. Um, just the hotels across the top of the water where you can look through the glass and, and look at all the fish and I don't mind doing a bit of snorkeling and, and scuba diving and stuff like that so yeah, I'd say the Maldives. Well get ready because this is the time we go looking for our crow's face in the crowd. Who's it going to be this week? Let's see, what about you? If you recognise yourself, make sure you contact the club by email before 5pm next Wednesday. Be ready with some photo ID and you'll receive a merchandise pack courtesy of Chemist Warehouse.
Now, the Crow Show is taking a break for three weeks to make way for the Seven Network's coverage of the Rio Olympics. But remember, you can keep up with all the latest Crow's news on the club website, afc.com.au. That wraps up today's show, brought to you by Chemist Warehouse. Thanks for your company, and we look forward to you joining us when we return on Sunday, August the 28th at 11.30. We'll see you then. Bye for now.